context here, uh, the excerpt from Little Gidding uh, uh, by uh, uh, T.S. Eliot, who came while well, he, he did die an Anglican of the particularly high sort. He came from a, a, a notorious uh, and powerful and important Unitarian family. Uh, one of his uh, relatives would become president of the American Unitarian Association. Another uh, uh, founded the Unitarian Church in uh, St. Louis and Washington University. Uh, quite the crowd. He wrote, We shall not cease from exploring exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know that place for the first time. I will repeat. We shall not cease from exploring and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. I would juxtapose that little piece with a Japanese proverb. Vision without action is a dream. Action without vision is a nightmare. I'll repeat. Vision without action is a dream. Action without vision is a nightmare. We are invited into a moment of silence to reflect, to gather, to simply be. Let us take this as an opportunity for meditation and contemplation or prayer. Your heart will tell you why.
recently, I was contacted by someone who explained he'd been made a spiritual teacher by the Tibetan master Padmasambhava. As that particular master has been dead for about 1,200 years, I admit I was suspicious. <laughs> he then went on to explain how there are serious problems in my spiritual tradition, Zen, and particularly with the discipline that I principally teach, koan introspection. I've been a practitioner on this way for nearly 50 years and a teacher for more than 20, so hearing there were problems, well, no surprise. <laughs> He then went on to explain that real spiritual practices, like he said, koans, are all mechanical. You stick yourself in one end and the and enlightenment comes out the other. <laughs> kind of like a meat grinder. He continued how the discipline as it is usually taught isn't quite right. And that's why not everyone who practices koans and gets enlightened. He then generously offered his fix sort of a spiritual version of a computer patch. I replied I wasn't interested, thank you. My mother taught me always to be polite. And then I blocked him. That's another computer term. The exchange did set me to thinking, however, not about surefire fixes to our spiritual practices, well, a little about that, but mostly about our paths themselves the whys and the ways we bring intentionality to the matter of life and death and meaning. It set me to thinking about what I call our maps of the spiritual life. That was really nice. Of course, with a talk to a bunch of Unitarian Universalists, beginning with some definitions of terms might be in order. So, first that messy and complicated word, spiritual. It can mean so many things. That's both the joy and the difficulty of language, and particularly words. We could spend all of our time here unpacking spiritual. But, let me simply summarize. Spiritual has its metaphorical roots in breath. And something I find really interesting is how, in fact, pretty much all cultures and their religions use this primary metaphor of breath for that quest for meaning and purpose in life. I take some particular significance out of that near, perhaps actually, universal use of spiritual for the great quest of our human hearts. And that brings up a second term necessary for this reflection. I first stumbled upon the term perennialism in Aldous Huxley's lovely book, The Perennial Philosophy, which I found in my mid-adolescence. For me, in my youth, searching for an intellectually honest spiritual path, which meant to me not obviously conflicting with the natural world, this book together with Richard Maurice Buck's Cosmic Consciousness and William James' Varieties of Religious Experience um, outlined the general direction for my quest for meaning and purpose in life. It definitely doesn't end there. In fact, today, I have serious criticisms of all three books. But they were how I started. That noted, I have that complicated relationship with perennialism. <laughs> On the one hand, I think it points broadly in the right direction when it suggests there are universal truths that each religion touch. This insight is a big reason I would eventually find myself a Unitarian Universalist. On the other hand, it seems pretty obvious to me that there is not a single mountain with all religions following their separate paths up to the same summit. Lots of different mountains. Pretty obvious to anyone who reads more than the headlines about religions. And with that, some of these religions I find are more useful than others, which is probably why Zen Buddhism and its disciplines remain the core of my actual interior life. Looking broadly, I find there are currents of religion that seem pretty obviously rooted in our biology, making those things universal, at least so far as humans are concerned. And if I read that correctly, I hope it would also be obvious 
These are insights available without any religion at all. Still, it is the primary project of religion, and with that, another definition. Religion, I find, consists of those attempts within cultures to coalesce their collective wisdom about meaning. Finding meaning, awakening, salvation, all those different words that point to some great healing of some terrible rift are in fact about our totally human, absolutely natural sense of disconnection. And with that, our deep ability to see into our connections. So, the real stuff is all about, as the Zen teacher Dosho Fort tells us, non-dual embodiment. Everything else is extras. And with that, spiritual max. We've well been warned by Alfred Kurzybski that the map is not the territory. And Gregory Bateson makes sure we get it by adding, the name is not the thing named. The reason that I close to immediately block my astrally ordained spiritual master was not the astral thing, although given my taste buds and such matters, that could have been enough, but because he reduced my spiritual path to a mechanical thing that just needed some oil at the juncture of some gears. That let me know he had no clue. There are spiritual disciplines. They can be enormously useful. I've given my life to one, but they are not mechanical. They are organic. I would add they are also human things, developed by people and subject to abuse. And always, always, they only help. They only point. They only shepherd. They only guide. Two other things have to happen not directly connected to the spiritual technologies we take up. One's volitional. We, that is you or me, we have to want. We have to be willing. We have to open our hearts and minds <coughs> to a project. Or, to use another difficult word, we have to surrender into the process. And still that isn't quite enough. Then, in some mysterious and frankly unfathomable unmappable, unpredictable way, the insight, the opening, the grace that allows us to see the whole thing in all its particulars happens when it happens. To quote the scriptures of the Western tradition, the spirit rests where it will. All this said, messy, map isn't the territory, spirit rests where it will, many truths, there are nonetheless genuine pointers for those of us who wish to walk the paths of spirit, who seek to know with our own lives the deeper realities of this life. There are maps we can trust. Trust, that is, as far as maps can be trusted. Words I hope that echo with all sorts of hesitations for anyone who has found their favorite GPS map, taking them in some endless loop at one time or another. If we use maps, we need to remember every once in a while to lift up our heads and look around. <laughs> Get that bigger picture. Do that, and then these maps can be quite useful. Possibly among the oldest strata of stories that help us mark out a spiritual path is hero's journey. Similarly, the Greek mystery writes, and here in the modern West, the life of Jesus turned into a cycle as a path for all of us. One of the most compelling maps for me is the 16th century uh, Spanish Christian mystic John of the Cross's map describing the, the ascent of Mount Carmel. While over the years, many have found John Bunyan's 17th century classic, sometimes called the first English language novel, The Pilgrim's Progress, enormously helpful. Bottom line, the map I've found most useful over the many years comes out of the Zen tradition. It's called by several names, most commonly either the tin ox herding pictures or even more simply the tin bowls. The metaphor of a bowl or ox as the image of ourselves and our hidden hearts is ancient. 
in the putative earliest strata of Buddhist texts, we find one that features the image of our path as taming a wild calf. The earliest strata of this actual map in Zen appears to be a five-step version by the 11th century Chinese master Sekyo, which features a gradual whitening of the image of the bull until there is simply an empty circle. Was that an amen? <laughs> However, it's not fully right, uh, and this conclusion is corrected by a rough contemporary, another Zen master, Chitoko Ki, uh, who adds in a sixth picture after that experience of emptiness. Also, there's another one with eight pictures. But the version that has captured most of us on the path who find in it a true representation of our way was formulated by a 12th century Chinese Rinzai master, Kakuan Xian. <coughs> it was an instant bestseller. Uh, uh, eventually, in fact, it made its way to Japan, and by way of the early translator and interpreter of Zen to the West, D.T. Suzuki, to us. Today, there are numerous commentaries on the text, starting with those from Kabwe. Rummaging around my, my own bookshelves, I found five by, the contemporary te by contemporary teachers, Chinese, Japanese, and American. It's a perennial on the perennial way. Let's look quickly at this map of our human hearts, of our longing, and our finding. First, it begins with noticing something is missing. For each of us, this might be something different. For me, at first, it was all about God. At the beginning, it was, is there a God? And then somehow, subtly, there was a shift, as I realized that God didn't have to be either the creator and sustainer or even the destroyer, but rather, as I wrote back in seminary, when I was much smarter than I am now, God is a hole in the language into which we throw all our hopes and fears. Hole, gaping wide. Although one of my professors helped me on the way of, to knowing a bit less, when she offered that, yes, God is a whole in the language, whole as in completion. Although I've long since learned any so-called completion only leads to something new. Whatever, we begin. In the images of the tradition, we name that longing of our hearts, the ox. Second, we find some traces, a footprint, maybe some spore. And that doesn't mean poop, that means smell. <laughs> Some of the, the, the younger in heart among us. Uh, um, for me, oh, it could be poop. Yeah, I can see that. Smell. For me, again, it was probably that shift of attitude from is to what. There is a mysterious turning when we launch on the spiritual journey. If we pay attention, if we allow our hearts to open to the possibilities, then it turns out possibilities abound. Third, then if we're lucky, we confront the ox. The power and beauty, as terrible as it is, well, it presents. Maybe it's seeing your newborn child for the first time. Possibly it's a kiss. Maybe it's finding a job that is more than a job. It can happen walking in the woods or on the beach. It can, and I find this most compelling, it can happen in a prison or a foxhole. However it presents, that confrontation with reality, with that ox, changes everything. Fourth. In Zen, there are many arguments, endless apparently, about whether you practice hard and then get enlightened, or you get enlightened and then practice hard. What I find is that practice and awakening are intimately connected, but not in any causal way. They are two facets of the same thing. But with a glimpse of the real, those of us committed to the way, we find our hearts calling and redouble the disciplines of the heart. For me, they are summarized as sit down, shut up, pay attention, and then repeat. Each of us needs to find that practice which is right for us. Fifth, 
here is the long path where we begin to find the disciplines are not so much about rules that contain us, but boundaries of our own heart. They are permeable. We cross freely from inside to out and outside to in. The whole world becomes ours. Here we discover the play of the world. Six. And with that, we hear the distant song. It may be faint, but it is enough. And we begin to follow it home. Seven. Here we forget all the stuff and bother. In the images, we find a simple hut. It's all we need. Eight. The image is an empty circle. Here we discover that nameless place the Taoist poem describes. The way that can be told is not the eternal way. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. In many Eastern spiritual traditions, this is the summum bonum. In fact, as I mentioned in the earlier version of the Oxford Earning Pictures, for many, it ends here. But, but, <clears throat> that would be too bad. Because, no, the image clutters up a bit. Here we get a picture of nature. Here we find our mother, or if you prefer, our father. Me, I love that continuing of the Tao Te Ching I just cited, where we see naming is the origin of all particular things. Naming is the mother of all particular things. Everything. Everything authentic, if passing. You, me. But now discovered with new eyes. Now held with open hands. Now encountered with a different kind of love. And yet, even this is not the end. The tenth Oxford in picture shows a fat man encountering the world. In some versions of the picture, the figure is actually walking into a marketplace. One traditional commentary says it is returning to the world with bliss bestowing hands. The small inside Buddhist joke is that the images of Hute or Hotai. He's the fat monk with the bag of gifts, sometimes called the Laughing Buddha. Not the Buddha of history, but a Zen monk who will become the Buddha of the next age. Part of the joke is that he represents our common inheritance, our common future. We're all the Buddha of a future age. So, that's one mapping of the spiritual path. One that I found particularly helpful. And maybe a little too. But let me add a little bit of direction. <clears throat> Another map of something important in my past was Kubler -Ross, Kubler, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Five Stages of Growth. <coughs> Perhaps you know them. Ag denial, <coughs> anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. They proved to be an amazing gift to people helping the dying, and also for many who were dying. Except that people quickly settled into these, uh, settled into these as the five stages. First you deny, and then so on up to acceptance. But people were involved. <laughs> people turn out to be messy. She named five true things, but people did them as they want, and in no particular order. Yes, that was an amen. And also, and this is important, often returning or starting over. Well, I suggest we may find the ten ox herding pictures are equally messy. I've known people who have manifested that returning to the world without ever having taken on a spiritual path. Not many, but, and well, pick your picture. It might be the beginning, and then you might discover you're jumping around. Probably will. That map, like Alfred Krzyzewski told us, is not the territory. Unlike the guidance of that astrally anointed spiritual teacher, the way is not mechanical. As T.S. Eliot sang into our hearts, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know that place for the first time, the spiritual way. And one more thing. We discussed at the beginning how these are hard times. So many dreadful things going on. And this is a particularly difficult moment. And there's that Japanese saying. 
I repeat it all the time because I need to hear it. Maybe you do as well. Vision without action is simply a dream. We heard that in our opening song. However, the rest of the service was action without vision becomes a nightmare. You want to be of use in this world? You want to heal the wounds of your own heart? Well, there are maps on that way. The real ones. They all take you, take us, into the mysteries of intimacy. How are we connected? How are we different? Find this, and you will know what to do. The intimate way. <laughs>